Okay, um, we're gonna kick off and we're hoping that everything will be okay. Having some signal saying that we have problems on Facebook, but it should be okay. So welcome if you've just tuned in. This is Goodness Christian Church and we are here in our Bible school. And if you're tuned in at a later date, uh, that's okay too. It's part of our life's, our Bible school and trying to help people. I'm Pastor Tom Hoban of the church. And it's also part of our four square cur uh, curriculum. And we're studying the whole area of hermeneutics. So I'm just going to go in there and try and make sure that YouTube is working fine. And everything's working fine as we go ahead. Um, seems as if it's okay. Uh, somebody liked it already. Fair play. <laughs> Uh, that's a faith statement, if there ever was one. Uh, so welcome anyway to Good News Christian Church. If you're here on Facebook or YouTube, please say hi in the chat. If you're on YouTube, um, of course, you might need a Google account or YouTube account to be able to do interact in the chat. Uh, it would be good for you to actually be able to interact in the chat tonight because I actually want to do a small bit of interaction with regards to what we're going to look at tonight in the area of studying of hermeneutics which is the whole interpretation of scripture and we've been studying many subjects along the way now i will tell you straight off for those who of you who are tuned in or tuned in at a later date or time that the next two weeks i will not have a broadcast because i'm actually taking a little bit of a break so for the next two weeks i will not have a broadcast if i do have a broadcast it's just because i on on a break i just wanted to do something but the odds are it won't happen and even then it will be a broadcast <coughs> it would be a recording put up at some stage but no for the next two weeks i don't perceive um we'll be doing any studies so that's next week next wednesday and the following wednesday so i just want to get that out of the way straight away <coughs> okay i'm getting a cough out of somewhere so welcome again if you're on youtube or facebook please make sure and say hi so that we know that you're in the room uh, hi Helen, I see you in there. Uh, Moni is away at the moment, so usually Moni is one of the first in there, and so she mightn't be coming in tonight. Again, I go over to Facebook and see who's in Facebook. Did okay. Where where is this going? Okay, go there. Go to Facebook, and here we are. Hi Zen, it's good to see you, man. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> good, Tessa. God bless you. God bless you. And uh, that's. Uh, um, from Dublin there I believe is after ch tuning in now again some people will be tuning in later uh, some people tune in and just look at the recording afterwards so either way be blessed and may it be a blessing to you as we continue on this is actually study 17 in the whole area of hermeneutics and we've been building brick upon brick block upon block to give a steady understanding and we're getting into some of the nitty-gritty now at this moment now we did study of recent when we're doing the hermeneutics um, the last areas that we started the studying was the whole historical well we went into the the concept of grammatical historical interpretation that's the evangelical way we we look at the grammar of the text as it is we look at what the meaning of the grammar and just look at it as its plain reading and we try and read it also in the historical context of the author the audience and what the author is uh, pointing to and that's the general way that we do it. So getting that kind of vibe as we go forward, we did look at all the other different forms of interpretation as well. But of course, that's, um, you know, there's the allegory, there's the pictures, all of those type of stuff. But as we looked at that, we saw that that kind of can lead you into all kinds of crazy pathways. And then lastly, the last one particularly that we were studying, we studied taking as an example the historical context of Corinthians. We started to look at Corinthians, the first letter of Corinthians, as an example that when you take a book of the Bible, whatever it is, Joshua, whether it's Kings, whether it's the Psalms, whether it is the Gospels, whether it is Corinthians, that you try and get into the historical context of the author. And we need some help that way because the Bible itself sometimes gives you some sense of the historical context but often we need some help and that's where some tools come in like bible dictionaries bible commentaries of course the introductions particularly uh, bible handbooks and we looked at that how it helps us to get into the context to bridge that historical gap 
And when you bridge that historical gap, it helps you to get in the mindset of the culture, the thinking, the problems, the joys, all that went on in that time. So that what was the author trying to actually convey from his culture, from his time frame, from his way of life to the lives of those around them. And until you bridge that gap, you're in danger of interpreting a text to say something that it never meant to say. And it's God's word. We believe it to be God's word. So we take it very seriously that God was speaking prophetically apt words, true authors to a particular people at the time by which God's word then is something we can glean off because of the, the attitude, the principles that are in place that we can glean off them. And then God can use that word to speak to us today. Very relevant messages, very relevant teaching. Of course, principles, certain principles are eternal. God is good, for instance, you know, some things are eternal. So we go into the text of the scripture, but also intelligently recognizing that when Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he wasn't writing to the church in Cork, Ireland. He had a specific people in mind with specific problems, with specific things. And we're like a fly on the wall. We get to hear the conversation that God is speaking under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, true Paul, true who he is, his makeup, his experience, true his personality. God is speaking through him words of blessings, words of correction, words of prophetic, words of doctrine. He's speaking through Paul to a particular people. And when we grasp the particular people and what they're going through and their problems, it really helps us then to interpretate the book as a whole. We also looked at that in the context, the historical context is also this context idea of that when you're interpreting scripture, that often, sadly, we sometimes can see one scripture taken out of context. Now, it could be true when they take the principle out of context, because it could be either directly true or it could be an inference of, of it could be, um, a, you know, a derivative of the actual principle. But really, if we're going to be good preachers and good teachers, if we're going to be good students of God's word, if we're going to be good disciples of God, God's word, we should really first, before we ever take little passages of scripture or little verses of scripture, we should really look at the context of the whole book, then the sections within the book, and then the paragraphs within the paragraphs, and then the verses, and even the words. So this idea of taking it in context, and that's what we looked at last week as well. Now we're on a study tree of context now, taking it all in context, putting it all in, in its proper place so that we are interpreting well. And as I said, we did look at already <coughs> Corinthians. And one of the things with Corinthians is, it is, you know, as an example, is to say, take the book of Corinthians and read it right the way through. Read it all the way through, get a sense of the problems that are going on, get a sense of who he's speaking to. And then as you're reading it through, as we looked at the last time, to begin to look at any phrases that are being repeated, uh, any problems that were brought up either by the, you know, there's internal evidence of what was the purpose of this book? What was Paul trying to say? Again, taking Corinthians, Corinthians as a, an example. What's the purpose of this book? Because once you start to find the key purpose or purposes, it really will help you to put things into context. The anchors, the other verses, the other paragraphs around that purpose. Because people wrote with intelligence. They were anointed by the Holy Spirit, but that does not mean they were spooky and crazy. They were bringing about uh, reasonable teaching through God's, God's word, through God's people, in very reasonable ways, understandable, communica uh, communicating something of purpose, something very clear. Another way to look at it is sometimes is the exhortations, the commands, to try and find out what was the, what was the end result that the, the author wanted, such as with Paul trying to say, what did he actually command them to do? What did he command them to think or change or challenge them, exhort them about something? What was the, what was the exhortations? And in that way, also, you get a sense of why he was trying to write this book. And that should, that should color or should say frame our way of looking at all the book and all the passages as we're reading. Because until we get a good exegesis, 
meaning take out of the scriptures what the author intended to say to the people at the time. Until we get a good exegesis, we cannot get a good hermeneutic for us today, uh, an interpretation for us today, what God is trying to say to us today. Um, now, sometimes people don't realize that exegesis is sometimes in hermeneutics considered the first stage. What did God say to them back then? And then the next stage is, so from there, what is God saying to us here and now? But we got to get a grasp. I know I'm repeating myself, but it needs to be because the church today, that's why we're doing hermeneutics. And that's why even Foursquare is asking, the Foursquare movement is asking all the leaders in all formships, no matter whether it's pastors, whether it's leaders, whether it's church council members, life group members, it doesn't matter. And then all the way into the disciples that they actually, all members of this church, church members, that they get a good understanding of how to do proper hermeneutics. Because it's, that's one of the problems. If people skew off the word of God a little bit here and there, it goes all the way into all kinds of craziness and messes people's lives up and all that. But when we get into God's word, God's word is food. It frees us. So, what was Paul trying to say in this context to the Corinthian church? Um, can we see those phrases repeated? Can we see, was there problems mentioned? And we saw, we started to look at particularly the book of Corinthians, we started to see there was two major sections. There was the first major section where Paul turned around and said, if you remember, Paul turned around and said, I'm, I'm writing to you these things because I, I heard that there's these problems going on. Chloe, members of Chloe's household of common told me these problems were going on. And so for a number of chapters, Paul deals with some of the problems he's heard about. In fact, chapters one to basically chapter seven. And then from chapter seven onwards, he turns around and says, now about the things you wrote about. So the problems that they actually must have writing a letter to him, got a letter, maybe through Chloe's household, of different problems. So we can, as an example in Corinthians, we can see that Paul is trying to deal with problems. He's trying to, he's trying to help people to progress from here to there through the words of God, through the inspired words of God. First of all, things that he's heard and seen or perceived. Second of all, things that they actually have questions about or brought up about. So we can get a sense of, of the letter of Corinthians. Now, we can find that in every book of the Bible. We can get the historical context a little bit through helps, like introductions and stuff like that. We can get it sometimes by reading the whole book as a whole and start to get a sense of the book. But as we read any book of the Bible, that we get our ears ready to to listen to what the whole Bible is saying, or the whole book, I should say, is saying, and then with that, try and sense the, the main purposes, the main purpose or purposes, and then bring that to every passage and text, unless we then are finding a passage or text that then suddenly transforms or takes away what we were thinking before and brings us into a deeper sense of purpose or a deeper sense of what the book was about. And that can happen, that can happen. And so we need to have that in mind. Now, as we were going through it, we also suggested that to get that kind of context and to divide it up is that as you're reading it, read it through a few times. You know, one of the things I do is read the Bible and pray in tongues and just let the Holy Spirit speak. And that's good. Now, that's not to negate all the other aspects of study. It's just to recognize that sometimes you catch it by the Holy Spirit as you're reading. Because <clears throat> the book, the Bible is for you. The Bible is wrote for you. It's not, it's not rocket science but it does take your intentionality and intelligence and integrity with the word that you're listening to. So when you're reading through, we, we started to say, okay, you divide it up and see what problems and you begin to do that. Maybe get a pen and paper, write it down. You begin to do that. You get that kind of introduction through a Bible handbook, a commentary, something like that. And you get that sense. Now, once you've kind of broken down the book, you hone in a little bit. Okay, you hone into a section of the book. And that's what I want to kind of look at tonight a little bit is honing into a section of the book as you do that. We, we saw that the, as an example, we saw, as, again, those first two major sections of, say, 1 Corinthians. We saw the first section where Paul is dealing with some stuff that he's heard about or he thinks about. And the second section uh, from chapter 7 onwards is where issues that they brought up concerning gifts of the Spirit, concerning the... Uh, the Lord's table concerning um, uh, concerning eating to idols, concerning a resurrection. We looked at that. But Paul brought up issues with the problems of disunity, the problems of 
uh, some immorality going on in the church, uh, some other problems that were going on. Uh, Paul brings up those things and lawsuits, the fighting going on, uh, the sexuality influence going on in Corinth and into the church. And so Paul brings up those issues. So let's dive into a section and then begin, as we said, we took the context of the book. And now let's dive into a section and take a section. So the first section I want to look at, of course, is, uh, well, not of course, I want to just look at, say, the first section where Paul says, these issues came up, Chloe's household brought it to me. And then I want to even dive it down a little bit further, because that itself, the first section is broken up into mainly two areas. First of all, or a few areas, first of all, there's the greetings, you know, the highs and so forth and so on and some of that. That's kind of chapter 1, verses 1 to cha verse uh, 9 in 1 Corinthians. And then going on from that, broken up into a number of areas. The first area, again, I, I'm, I'm breaking this up and giving you a hint already. The first area is a little bit about the unity in the church and leadership and stuff. And then the second area is about the incest that was going on in the church and Paul addressing that, that he's heard that there was incest going on. Now, these aren't the issues that the Corinthians brought up. These are issues that Chloe's household and some other aspects that he heard about. The third area was the problems of infighting with regards to lawsuits, with regards to suing one another because Christians, for some reason, in the business. And Corinth was, a, again, getting the context, Corinth was a very metropolitan uh, gateway city, gateway place, uh, even for ships and so forth, traveling back and forth. There was a, a certain part where they literally used to carry ships over a certain area onto the other scene rather than going all the way around. So it was a very business orientated place. It was a very trade, a lot going on. You heard of the Olympics, but there was also the Corinthian Games it was a big thing there. So there's a lot of things going on there, a lot of business going on. There's a lot of temples and idols and stuff like that as well. We won't get into that now, but there's also a Roman garrison. So there's a lot of what comes with military camps. There's a lot of um, money going around, a lot of different things. So that was happening there. So it was very much that way. So some of the Christians were in business and sadly, some of the Christians didn't agree to whatever business happened. So they were bringing them to the courts and lost it. So Paul deals with that. And then of course, then there was that area where there were so many temples, but a lot of the temples were involved in all kinds of different teachings and stuff. And and particularly the immorality that went on with the worship of Diane, the and then there was the the prostitute temple, the prostitutes in the temple, and a lot of the Christians might have even been involved in that before they came to Christ, and and then when they did come to Christ, that it looks like some of them were still going uh, to the prostitutes in the temple, and some of them possibly might have even been involved a little bit in the business side of it. I don't know. We we don't know exactly what's going on, but Paul addresses that. So even in the first section, chapters 1 to 7, Paul deals with particularly four areas. The division in the church, the area of incest in the church, as in something going on between a son going off with his stepmother. There is the area of infighting with lawsuits and business, and how do you deal with that in the church and what's going on and, and the attitude that should be there. And then there was the area of um, going off with prostitutes and stuff like that, and the temple prostitutes. <clears throat> so that's the four areas he deals with there. Now, later on, of course, he deals with other areas that were brought up, marriage, singleness, food idols, head coverings, the Lord's table, spiritual gifts, uh, community, worship, all of that, the bodily resurrection of believers. Even he got into the whole missions trip and missions money and the offerings of that and, and, and that. So... There's other areas that he will deal with afterwards. Now, again, if you're taking things in context, the best thing to do, if you're going to be a good student of the Word of God and a good person of the Word of God, is to really read the whole book and get a sense of the divisions. Now, when we do dig deep, for instance, dig deep is literally digging deep into each book of the Bible. That's part of our also our Bible curriculum, our theological studies. And what we try to do when we're doing Corinthians is to dig deep now one of the things to dig deep is this is i kind of just ask okay you read through it again the book is there anything that jumps out is there any problems that jump out so that's one of the questions kind of that came about in helping the person to ask those very questions so in the workbook for dig deep in one corinthians that would have been the thing 
a number of those kind of questions would have been brought up. <clears throat> but another aspect in the Dig Deep that to try and again do this, to actually put this into practice, is that over certain sections I would have had, uh, say, I would have helped a little bit because I would have brought the division uh, or the divisions of the book there. And then I would have asked the, the student as such, the, the disciple that I'm trying to disciple, okay, in this section here, can you give in just one small sentence a heading that kind of says what this section is about? Not what it means to you, not some kind of spiritual, it might be very spiritual about angels or something, but it doesn't have to be. Just what is the author trying to say in this section? What's the topic in this section? And if you can even bring it to a case of what is the topic and its application in a sentence? For instance, like say, this is two leaders to unify. You know, there's it's about leadership and the application is unify. So to try and think that way, to try and think what is the topic with the application. That will help you with the kind of exegesis, what's the topic? And the application is probably there in the scripture, but even if it's not clearly there, that you're getting to already a, a little bit of the hermeneutic or the homiletic. The homiletic being the message you might bring to others if you're a leader in ministry. So you want to get the exegesis. So you're reading the section and you're trying to find out what the topic is. So I would have given those divisions out within, within the study in Dig Deep of 1 Corinthians. So the same would happen if we're doing John's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, Galatians or Romans. Get in a section and try and do that. So it's a very good thing to do. So... Tonight, we're going to do a little bit differently. Um, tonight, I want you to get your Bible. Get your Bible because we're going to read a little bit of Scripture. And again, I'm going to ask some questions. Now, remember, there's a little bit of time delay between YouTube chat and Facebook. So if you're here live tonight, I don't know who's here live, who's not. If you're here live, get ready to also kind of maybe interact a little bit with me. This is part of particularly those of you who want to have accreditation within Foursquare. I want to know you're actually thinking. It's not just hearing me talking head and saying I've done it. No, you didn't do it. Stop pretending. You need to interact with it and get your mind wrapping around it. So please, uh, please just interact with this if you can. So uh, get ready to do that. And even if you've um, tuned in at a later date, again, in the comment section, either in YouTube or in Facebook, interact interact with it and I'll interact back with you on that. Um, sometimes we would probably do this kind of more in a Zoom situation but I want to make this public, I want to bring a blessing to all those who listen in. So the section we're actually going to read tonight, it's a good size section, but it's the first topic. It's the first topic that Paul starts to address. And so we're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians, we're going to be reading from chapter 10, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter verse 10. 1 Corinthians, verse 10, all the way to chapter 4, verse 21. So we're going to just take that section. Now, generally speaking, in that section, I would have kind of said, okay, tell me what is, you know, you make a heading for that. So maybe even consider a heading as we read. And so we're going to read it through once. Again, this is how to help you to in, take it in context and interpret it well. So we're going to read from chapter 1 of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 10 all the way to chapter 4, verse 21. Let me even bring up my own Bible first. But as you're getting your Bibles ready and as you're doing that, let me pop in also to YouTube and Facebook and see who's in there. Uh, let me let me just go in there for a second. Uh, I want to see who's in there. Okay. Let me just pop in. Okay. Hi, Alish. Hi, Mercy. Hi, Helen. Good to see you. At least she didn't think there was a teaching tonight. Yeah, there is a teaching tonight, uh, but next week and the week afterwards, there won't be. I I'm working all the way up to uh, Friday or Saturday, probably. <laughs> <clears throat> but no, there won't be a, there won't be a teaching um, next week or the week afterwards. There won't be a teaching. I'm glad that you must have hit the notification bell, so I'm glad it popped up for you. I'm glad it popped up for you. Uh, good stuff. Uh, let me go into Facebook, see who's in Facebook. Uh, hi Jamie, good to see you. I don't know Zen if you're still in, but blessing there's uh, three people there. So if you're still tuned in, I see three people there in Facebook. Please say hi. 
if you're in Facebook. So we're going to go into 1 Corinthians. Again, if you're even looking at the recording of this, please make sure and um, make sure and interact at a later time. Now let me bring up my Bible myself. 1 Corinthians, I'm not doing a slide, so you need to get open your own Bible. If you're on your phone looking at YouTube, please know unless you've subscribed, if you go into your Bible on your phone, your, your actual connection will disconnect. So consider, consider getting a physical Bible out. So 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians, here we go. We're going to look at starting on chapter 1 and we're going to look at verse uh, 10 following. Are you ready with me? <clears throat> so verse 10 and following, and I'm going to read it out. Now, in your Bible, I'm reading from the NIV Bible, but of course you can read from any Bible, but I'm reading from the NIV Bible, and the NIV has headings already. Those headings can be good, but they also can be bad because, uh, you know, they're not inspired by God. Those headings are the interpreters or the publishers who put those headings in, and they can be good. They can be very helpful, but really, it, it can also make you lazy, if you get what I mean. Lazy of mind and lazy of intellect. But they can be helpful, and we need all the help we can get most of the time. So, that's not a bad thing. But again, when I give out the sections, for instance, this section here, chapter 1, <coughs> verses 10, all the way to chapter 4, verses 21. I'm going to read it all the way through. It's a fair bit of reading, so you ready with me? Please, stay tuned. And then I'm going to be asking you some questions and we're going to break it down a little bit further. Okay, starting off, verse 10. Okay, chapter 1, verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, is one of you says I follow Paul, another says I follow Apollos, another says I follow Cephas, still another says I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Cephas and Gainas. So no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, but beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the intelligence of the intelligence I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of, this wor of the world? For since the wisdom of the world... Sorry, no, oh, dyslexia kicked in. For f since the wisdom of God... The world, through its wisdom, did not know him. God was pleased, through the foolishness of what was preached, to save those who believe. Jews demand the signs, and Greeks, they look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us the wisdom of God. 
that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Chapter 2. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence of human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise, persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined to our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the, his own, their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words thought by human wisdom, but in words thought by the spirit, in explaining spiritual realities with spirit thought words. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but, a, but a, such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has the mind of the Lord so that as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk and not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, and are you not mere, are you not mere, hu mere human beings? What after all is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos was watered it, but God has made it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. For one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are fellow workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a war reward. If it is burnt up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourself are God's temple and that God's spirit lives among you? 
If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Caiaphas, or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are of Christ and Christ is of God. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and it will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against another. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Uh, sorry, and if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you, though you did not? Verse 8 of chapter 4. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have become, begun to reign and without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign so that I also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We have may, been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. We are honored, but... You are honored, but we are dishonored. To this very air, air hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. And when we are cursed, we bless. And when we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. Now, what I want you to do on Facebook and on YouTube, I want you to straight away write down any words or phrases that you thought were being repetitive. What was the phraseology? What were some of the things that Paul kept on referring to? It was very clear in this passage. Now, what was the problem he was dealing with? The problem he started off and dealing with in this whole passage, again, remember chapters and numbers and stuff like that are put in afterwards so they can block you from actually getting a good grasp of what he's dealing with. So let's be careful there. But remember also, now please do interact while I'm doing that. What was the main phrases? What was the main things that were coming up? But remember also that he started off with the whole area of the problem. <clears throat> the problem being that he heard through Chloe's household and he heard through different ways that there was divisions in the church, that the church was in divisions. And, and also he even later on got into it and said, you're arguing a lot. So he saw the church having a lot of divisions and those divisions actually possibly doing damage to the church. How do I know about damage? Because he talks about who shall destroy God's temple. We are, and that word he uses the plural in Greek, you are God's temple, meaning plurally. We would say in English, sometimes in old English, ye, meaning plural. And who will destroy God's temple? Ye are, or you are God's temple. And so he sees that some of this division is trying to actually destroy the church, destroy the local church. He saw it for what it was. So he's addressing this issue. So what was the main tactic that Paul used 
in this. Now, some of it will help you if you have read a little bit about the background, the background of current, the background of the culture. If you knew a little bit about the, the religious culture and the philosophic culture of the time. Paul started to hint at, if you can see again and again, this phraseology between wisdom, the wisdom of God, you see yourself as wise, you see yourself as great. He started to, you see what I'm saying now? That was the phraseology being used again and again and again, wisdom. He kept on referring to wisdom. Now, you see, at the time, the division was causing a little bit because some were coming along eloquent, with eloquent wisdom. Some would have been even possibly rhetoric type people who became Christians, who were gifted in their presentation, gifted in their ability to lead people, not necessarily lead them the right way, but gifted. But God knows the heart and God will judge the heart and the sincerity and the work of each person and how they're really building. What's really in the sight of God is a little bit different than what's in the sight of the world. And to some degree, there's some people even judging Paul. Paul doesn't care about their judgment, except for the fact that he doesn't care about their judgment in the sense of personal. He's not taking it personal. But he does care about their judgment in the sense of that if it's stopping them from hearing the good news in a good way. So he cares about their judgment only in that respect. So he, he challenges them. And he challenged them, and he's actually very tongue-in-cheek. If you read and in the context, you see he's very tongue-in-cheek. You think you're great. You think you're honorable. You think not many of you were born noble. Come on out of it. Humble yourself. Get a bit of a cop on here. You know, he's really hitting at that. And he's hitting at the fact that you think you're wise. And he, he starts to say, but the wisdom of this world is foolishness in the eyes of God. So he's really getting at a little bit uh, about these issues. Now, remember, he's dealing with division. But he's actually going to the root where he sees the root. The root of the problem is not necessarily this group following Paul and this group following Apollos and this group following Caiaphas and stuff like that. The root that Paul is dealing with, he's dealing with the root and he sees the root as a pride. A pride in their own wisdom and intellectual ability. A pride in what seems to be uh, worldliness. I've seen it even in the churches today. You know, the churches today sometimes... It's, it's not happening now. What I'm about to say doesn't happen in Ireland now, but I can I can refer to this. There was a time back in the 80s and the early 90s when any preacher came from America or any other country, it's like every, and it still happens at some level. It's kind of sad. Every, every, every person wanted to go and be prayed with and listen to that preacher and whatever. But the local Irish guy, the local Irish lady, who was preaching just as good in actual fact, sometimes even better in the sense of its context or in the sense of the, the Holy Spirit's purpose. And, but some, now some great preachers came true, some great Americans, some great English preachers, some great other preachers came true, but it's like as if they got a, they got a pass card, they got a, a grace card, they got a, I don't know what you want to call it, like, you know, people came and flocked and praised them and put in money in the offerings and everything. And, but then when the Irish person was coming and really out of a heart for the people and a faithfulness to go there again and again and again. No, there was that kind of like, well, you know, it's like the prophet is not accepted in his hometown type thing. I've experienced it and many others have experienced. Now, it's not as bad today. It's still there, though. You know, looking to preachers on TV or whatever like that and all different stuff. And forgetting that God wants to work here in Cork City or wherever you are in Dublin or wherever you are in, in Foursquare in Ireland. Or around the world for that matter, whoever's listening in. And so there can be that way. We, we are still very prone to X-factor mentality, both from the preacher but also from the audience as such or the people. And Paul is trying to hint that here is, I can't come to you, I mean, he could, but he said, I didn't come to you with great eloquence or great wisdom. No, I came to you with the simpleness of the gospel and the foolishness. It seems foolishness to you, doesn't it? He says, he, he mentions the Jews, but he's really hitting at, and to the Gentiles, it's foolishness. He's really hitting at, you want wisdom, you want some hidden wisdom and mystery. 
and happens today as well. Give me that mystery's word. There's that flesh. It goes to the flesh. And Paul then hits at it very even clearly. He he uh, he jolts them. He he kind of he kind of hits at them, and then he even goes on to say. I really do have words of wisdom, God's wisdom and deep message, but I couldn't speak them to you because you can't handle it because you're still immature. You're still just children. You, you know how I know you're children? Because you're fighting like children. You're fighting like children because deep down you're still immature in your, in your heart and your way of thinking. And, and that shows to me that you can't handle even the deeper things. You need to come to the simplicity of the gospel and really get it ingrained into your spirit and applied to your heart. Are you with me? Now, I'm not preaching about Corinthians now. I'm talking to you about how you interpret it. I'm talking to you about how you take it in context. So now you take that whole passage in context. What heading would you give it? What heading, if you were to make a heading, you were publisher of the Bible or you're you're preaching and you're going to preach from this whole, you know, this whole passage. What heading would you give it? Well, of course, first of all, we know it's Paul dealing with the, the um, division. So we know that the subject matter is dealing with division. How could we maybe hone that in a little bit better? Well, we don't need to add in Paul. We, should, we could say dealing with division in the church. I'm only throwing out some things here. We could say dealing with the root of division in the church uh, we could even go a little bit further maybe dealing with the root of false pride that causes division in the church now we don't want to make it too long we want to we want to keep it honed in but that helps you then as you're breaking down each patch did you see what i'm doing there when we see that's going on there we're dealing with false wisdom worldly wisdom so what way would you phrase it? And what way you'd phrase it is up to you. Long as it's long as it's with integrity with the intended order to the intended audience, long as it's with integrity that you might phrase it a little bit different. You might even come out with a, a nice catchphrase that can be memorable, which is great if you can, because then it helps you to anchor in what that whole passage is about. And also then if you're a leader or you're influencing others, if you say, that catchphrase, that phrase to someone else, they, they can catch it too. And it helps helps people to remember as they're reading. So as you can see here, we take a passage. Now, this is one passage within the book. So the book is dealing with problems. So now if that's the passage and then we have other passages, what's all of Corinthians about? Now, this, why I wanted to hone in on this one, even though it's a big one, is I wanted to hone in that to some degree... Not only is the division coming out of the immaturity and the false sense of wisdom that they think they have, to some degree, this is an undertone all the way through 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. That Paul is dealing with a little bit of a, an attitude that the Corinthian church, many in the Corinthian church have of their sense of superiority, their sense of that they are wise and that they got it more together. And Paul is dealing with to some degree that throughout the whole book. And so there's that little theme going all the way through, whether he's talking about uh, money, whether he's talking about uh, sexuality, whether he's talking about the gifts of the spirit, whether he's talking about doctrine stuff. That's kind of going through the whole book. And it can help you that Paul as a book, I would like to put it this way. He's dealing with an immature church as a book. The purpose of the book is Paul is trying to help an immature church become mature. He's trying to help an immature church become mature, a carnal church. Now, it's a very spirit-filled, gifts of the spirit church, but it's still an immature church. So it can help you as you're looking at stuff now i'm giving you a lot more than i would normally give you if you're studying it yourself and so you break it down like that now one of the things to make sure that you're getting it in context then is to take every passage and to try and give headings to every passage in the argument so first of all he's dealing with division and so there's the division that's going on but just 
you know, it's somewhat going through the whole book. There's division the about how the gifts of the spirit work. There's division the about what is the resurrection. There's division the about how we should deal with immorality. There's division the about um, the Lord's Supper, who should come, who should sit, where, where they should sit, the rich sit here, the poor sit there, when we should start. So there's all these aspects going in, but it really is stemming from an immaturity that comes from a sense of pride also, that they haven't really come to a, a great place of humility. And he, he's really he's really being cheeky when he says, and you reign, and if you really did reign, I wish we would reign with you. But, you know, he's, he's being a little bit cheeky. If you can hear that when you read it in context, Paul is giving him a little bit of a kind of like a goading them a little bit. Again, reading it in other versions can help you to get that sense, depending on the different versions. So... Then also what we would do then is we'd take that passage and then we'd also know it's in the context of the book, as I said, and then we break it down. So there's that wisdom. You might have heard the wisdom repeated. Now I want to go in there and see if anybody is interacting before I need to go further about anything that you came up there. Uh, let me see. Yeah, unity, fools, foolishness, wisdom, talking about servanthood. Good stuff. Uh, thanks, Helen. I didn't see anybody else interacting there. I don't know if everybody's in there. If you tune in at a later date or time, please interact. If you can, just even let me know what's going on and let me go over to Facebook. Thanks, Helen, for interacting there. Uh, okay, let me go over to Facebook. Let's see, is there? Hi, Elizabeth. It's good to see you. Uh, powerful words. Okay. Uh, God's wisdom. Yes, Pascal. God's wisdom only given through the Spirit of God. Mere human wisdom against god's wisdom and amen paul is saying paul is saying stay humble stay loyal to christ stay humble absolutely there's a there's an aspect of their pride is causing division absolutely there's a humble so you can see that coming through that's elizabeth brought that out in facebook staying humble so let me go back to youtube just in case anybody else has just interacted there okay i don't see any more interactions uh, again, if you've tuned in at a later time or a later date, please interact as best you can. Okay. Uh, I know some people might have just tuned in there. They might have realized that we're online and then just realized we're online. So let me go back here. I just realized I have that there. Okay, let me go back here. So let's then look at a little bit of a passage a little bit deeper. Let's go a little bit deeper because each time you... you each time you go down, you know, you, you, you go down a little bit deeper, you get into basic more questions, what, where, how, everything, and even get into every grammar sentence. So you need to bring it down and think in paragraphs. The arguments that happen in different paragraphs as we go down deeper. So let's say, for instance, just simply this, let's take uh, chapter 1, verses 10, and maybe go to verse 17. Let's take this. Chapter 1, verses 10. All the way to verse 17. You with me? Okay, I'm going to read that out again. Chapter 1, verses 10, 17. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and in thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you, what I mean is this, that, is that one say I follow Paul, another says I follow Apollos, and another says I follow Caiaphas, still another says I follow Christ. So is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I did not baptize any of you except, for, except Caiaphas and Gainas. And, so no one can say that I baptized them in my name. Yes, I, I baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember baptizing anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So, if you were to make a heading over that. Now, the NIV kind of gives a big hint already. But again, you're breaking down the argument now. So, he's dealing with a whole argument about the vision. We saw that. He's dealing with that. But So, what's this in this verse to say 10 to 17? What, what would you put as a heading just for that, breaking it down again? Like in one sense, Paul is stating his purpose for the next sections, the next paragraphs. Or he's stating the problem. 
Paul states the problem of division in the church. Paul is addressing division in the church. Acknowledging there's a problem in the church of division. You know, so getting the paragraph, then honing it down to that paragraph. As best as you can. Making a statement. Now, if you're going to be a good interpreter of the Bible, then you, you kind of get that down. You know, you write that down. You find a way in the margin somewhere. Again, you might have help with the Bible you have already, but you, you're called to engage in the word. You know, the, 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 the wording that might be there on the heading of your Bible, if you have a physical Bible, might be a good heading. But I would really try and encourage you to write your own heading that is in the context and the purpose of that paragraph or paragraphs or that, that you know, versus there's two paragraphs mentioned here in, in the NIV that's par it's parsed out as two paragraphs. Let's take another one. Let's take, for instance, uh, will we go from, uh, what way have I done it in the Bible study? Let me look at, I was gonna look at maybe, I was gonna look at maybe verses 18 to three, four. Let me look at what I've done in my Dig Deep study. I brought it one, 10 to 17 in study 3. 1 Corinthians study 3 is 10 to 18. And I, I've broken that up. E even, for instance, in the study, when we dig deep, this is the thing that I've done. For instance, in Dig Deep, there's the main heading for chapter verses 10 to 17. What we just looked at. The problem. And then I've even broke that down into subheadings 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 just on its own subheading for that bringing it down even deeper subheading for 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 11 now there's a few sentences there going down a bit deeper subheading for 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 12 to 13 subheading then for 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 14 to 16 and a subheading then for 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1 verses 17. To break it down even further, to get what is the meaning. And that's digging deep. That's getting exegesis. What is the word of God saying? So getting down deeper into it. Let's take another passage of scripture. Let's look at, uh, say, it's in the 1 Corinthians study, the dig deep study, for instance, in 1 Corinthians. I've actually broke it down in in my um, study as a hint, I went from chapter 1, verses 18 to chapter 2, verse 5. So you ready with me? We're going to read chapter 1, verses 18 to chapter 2, verses 5. That's the way I've broken it down. Some break it down a little bit different. They go to chapter 2, verses 3. Some, as the NIV did, it didn't break it down. It just went down to the end of the chapter, which again, these divisions are not, you know, they're, they're human ideas. I'm just trying to help somebody when I do dig deep. So you ready? We're going to read chapter verses, chapter 1, verses 18 to, to chapter 2, verse 5. And I want you to think, what subheading would you give for that? What's the main idea? Not your idea. Not what you'd like it to say. Not what other people say. What do you think is the main, what do you think the author is saying to these people? What's the main idea, the main purpose, or the main, you know, topic? What is he dealing with here? Ready? So let's read it from chapter 1, verse 18. To ver chapter 2 verses 5 okay here we go for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of God for it is written I will destroy the wisdom of the wise the intelligence of the intelligence I will frustrate where, do, where is the wise person where is the teacher of the law where is the philosopher of this age has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world for since the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand the signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you wore when you were called. 
Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many were influential, not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world to the despise things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us the wisdom of God, that is our righteousness and holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so it is with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come to you with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony of, about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So what heading would you give that as a major, as a section within his argument dealing with the vision? What, what, what would you say Paul is mainly saying here? Now, again, I don't want to try and put too many phrases in your mind, but I'm just trying to get us through kind of the way I would think or the way I'm trying to help you with hermeneutics is I see here that Paul is trying to make just here. He's trying to make the difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. And then with that, also the humility that we are should be in, as we recognize that we, in comparison to God, are not wise, and that we need God's wisdom, particularly through Christ Jesus. So, again, boiling it down a little bit further. How can I boil it down to a simple sentence? I really think the best way possibly is the, is the difference between the wisdom, the effectual wisdom of God, Versus the wisdom of man. The ineffectual wisdom of man. Let's put it that way. The effectual wisdom of God against the ineffectual wisdom of man. Now, again, even within that, you will see that there's at least three sections even within that. So, again, after that, I would try and even boil it down even further. For instance, I would take 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 18 to 25. I would try and boil that down into a heading. Then I would try and boil down into a heading um, the whole area of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26 to 31. And then I would try and boil down the heading, for instance, in the last section a little bit of 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 1 to 5, where Paul talks about his own humility and his own, uh, you know, his calling. So again, if we were to take those down, those three, let's look at it in. A, uh, let's look at it a little bit deeper. Forgive me, I'm stumbling over my words here. So, if we take it down, go back to uh, one Corinthians. Let's look at it, verses eighteen, and then following. So here we see the difference between. Again, I would even break it down a little bit further. The wisdom of God against the the foolishness of man, the philosophers of this age. That would be chapter 1, verses 18, all the way down to verses uh, 25. The wisdom of God against the foolishness of man and the effectual wisdom of God. Verses 26, all the way down to verses 31. The foolishness that God uses, or the, the foolish people that God uses. Like, But not many of you were wise and so forth and so on, but God chose the foolish things of, the, of this world to shame the wise. The, how God, I, I'll try and boil it down into a heading of how God uses foolishness to bring in his wisdom. How God uses foolish people in his wisdom. How God uses um, humble people in his wisdom. And then, of course, the third section, then breaking it down even further, uh, talking about Paul. Paul working, <laughs> Paul preaching or working as uh, in humility to God's wisdom. God I'm just phrasing off. I haven't got this written down, you see. So I have it written down somewhere else, but I'm not, I'm not turned to it. I'm just taking it on the fly with you right now here to just talk to you about it. Paul's uh, resolve to not rely on his own wisdom, but the wisdom of God. 
Paul's humility in preaching God's wisdom, not man's. You know, things like that to, to break it down. What is Paul is getting at? Now, remember, this is only one part of his argument with regards to division in the church. Now, from there, I would break it down even further. Some of you have done this with me, where I'll take each sentence of the Bible, literally each sentence, and I will break down each sentence and I will bombard each sentence of the Bible with what, where, when, how, who, everything. Let's take, for instance, let's take, if you have your Bible open, let's take, um, let's take, uh, go back to verse chapter one. Let's take verse 18, the sentence in verse 18, chapter one, 18. So this is the verse. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I would break that very sentence down. I would look at that sentence and read that sentence. Because remember, we're to think in the book. To think in the sections. To think in the paragraphs. To think in the sentence. And to break it all the way down. I would take this very verse and I'd say, for the message of the cross. So we might even say, what is the message Paul preaches? He preaches the message of the cross. What is the message? Uh, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Okay. To those who are perishing, what is the message of the cross of Jesus like? The answer is foolishness. Or you might ask the question, what is foolishness with regards to the message of the cross? Or what is the result of foolishness, I should say? What is the result of foolishness with regards to the cross? Perishing. These are the questions I would ask. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What do those who are being saved, what do they think the message of the cross is? They think it's the power of God. Or what is the message of the cross to those who are being saved? It is the power of God. I might even ask the question about, uh, say for instance, uh, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, who are being saved. Yeah, I might even ask this question. Does Paul see himself as saved in this verse or as being saved? And there's one for you. I mean, I'd really go into it. I'd be hitting this, hitting this sentence with every question here. Does Paul see themselves as saved or as being saved? From this verse, of course, the answer is being saved. Now, another verse of the Bible would say saved. So again, it's helping you to put the jigsaw pieces together. So as you do this, this is inductive logic. You're, you're looking at every aspect you're going and getting all the little facts together and then out of that becoming to get an awareness of what Paul is trying to teach now by doing that sometimes it can enhance sometimes it can change a little bit about what you think the whole passage is about what you think the whole argument is about because as you go deeper into each sentence each sentence with its purpose every sentence has a purpose and that sentence those words are somewhat again this is the grammatical Remember, the grammatical hermeneutical interpretation process is you see that each word has its meaning within the context of the sentence. I don't take a word out and make it something weird and wacky. I'm not called to do that. I'm called to say that this author under the anointing of the Holy Spirit was communicating something that was within the grammar of what they knew. So I take each of the sentences and the words together and I see them in a sentence. And then with that, as I really dive into that, I see that sentence is within a paragraph. Now, to some degree, the paragraphs that are set out are, you know, the different publishers, the di different interpreters have put the paragraphs together. But even you yourself can actually see that there's a certain thought structure within a paragraph. So again, the sentence means what it means within the grammar of the paragraph or in the context of the paragraph. And the paragraph means in the context of the section. And the section is in the context of the book. And then to some degree, that book 
from a theological point of view and even from helping to interpret it, the theological meaning is in the context of the Bible. And that's what we do. We're called to dig deep and extract the truth of God's word within the context of the text, but also the context of the author and the context of the audience. And as you dig deep like that, you will get a proper exegesis, or at least as close to it as possible. And then from there, from there, the Holy Spirit can begin to give you a hermeneutic, a hermeneutic of interpretation. You, you, from that exegesis foundation in the hermeneutic process, you can begin to get a hermeneutic of what God is, means to them then, and what God is speaking and means to us now. For instance, here's a little example. I might get this hermeneutic. If I want to have unity in our church, humility is a must. That's a hermeneutic. Coming to today. And if I'm going to preach unity, if I want to have a message of unity, I could take this passage and then after I bring out the exegesis of it to exhort people in our church, for instance, Corinthian, our church here in Good News, our church in Foursquare, that we need to be people of humility and recognize that no one person is to be X factor, you know, to respect, absolutely, but not have that hero worship of any one person because it's all from God, the wisdom of God. I could bring out those type of things. Now, that might sound simplistic, but remember that if we really attune our spirit, this is the Pentecostal in me coming out now. If we really tune our spirit and our soul, our thinking and our emotions and our being to the truth of this word, that even though people might have said the same thing before, when you're coming from a place where you've actually got revelation and dug deep and the truth and it's, it's solid within you, when you speak out those words, they have power. They have power because they're theologically sound, biblically sound. And for us who are definitely those of you who are Pentecostal, we want to be word based, but spirit filled. We want our words to be spirit and life, just as Christ. We want to do that. And so it calls for that. But as you dig deep into the word, in the context of the word, and get it, then when you preach, even if you don't necessarily quote word for word the Bible, that it's coming from a biblical place. It's coming from a, a word of God place and it's prophetic particularly if it's dealing with issues in a church situation that you're visiting or that you're in or whatever. And you can then bring out these truths to help deal with, because this is the other side of it. From a biblical point of view and from a spiritual Pentecostal point of view, if this is God's word intended not only for the Corinthians, but by God's overarching anointing, by God's overarching hand, by God's overarching management, because there's many things wrote in the early church, but these are what was canonized into the scripture, that we have to trust that God has put this into our hands because he sees that it's necessary to speak these truths through all the ages until Jesus returns. This is what I'm trying to say, is that we're going to face the same type of problems because there's a spirit behind them that is going to be attacking the churches all throughout the world all the time in this area. So there'll always be an attack to some degree, trying to create a Corinthian atmosphere where they might have the gifts of the spirit, but they're very immature. So this is the remedy for this by God's Holy Spirit, not only the Corinthian church through Paul, but as we extrapolate some of these principles because the same spirit of God has the same answers to the same forces of evil that would try and cause divisions in churches. And how does he cause divisions in churches? Because we can see that, get my hermeneutic, get where I'm get, getting at, but now I've dug deep into the word first, that we can see that the spirit of division often works strategically by getting into the minds and hearts of people about how wise they are or how wise somebody else is and having this hero worship and forgetting that it's not about the wisdom of man, it's the simplicity of the gospel and it's the wisdom of God. And there is deep wisdom of God, there is mysteries of God, but that in one sense is no good to anybody. They'll choke on it unless they get the foundational truth of Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
and that the wisdom of God through the death and resurrection of Jesus is really where we get redemption, where we get righteousness, where we, it's the wisdom of God displayed in the simplicity that one man who innocent died in our place, rose again, and the simple, straightforward gospel. To not go away from that. We don't need extra. We don't need something hidden, occult. We don't need something wiser than that or more mysterious than that. The simple thing is the wisdom of God. And it's profound and yet adept with wisdom. Now, so if we're dealing with division in the churches today, that we need to be aware that one of the things that can happen from a hermeneutic point of view, looking at this, if we believe that God's intended word, not only to Corinthians, but to us today, God's Bible to us today, that was a work of the Holy Spirit for us today, that there is that division that can happen in churches and in situations as people who are immature have this X factor mentality and this idea that they are wiser and looking for this hidden wisdom and hidden knowledge and stuff like that. And God's words is saying to us to bring humility, but the preachers and the leaders to be humble. Paul said, this is the practice for me and Apollos, that we are to stay humble and, and to keep preaching the simple gospel and, and demonstrate in as much as we can to bring out the change and the power in people's lives that it brings out about change in their lives. Can I have an amen there? And so we can extrapolate and we can bring a homiletic to that talking about the wisdom of God, talking about people to, to not let people know that there's a subtlety and there's a, there's a pride of man, even spiritual pride or spiritual. And that can happen, for instance, even in theological schools as well, just as much uh, or articulate in different ways. Or it can happen in Pentecostal stuff as well, where people just sometimes they're very articulate and very up, whip up the crowd very well. Not wrong with that. Not in wrong with the gift of, of, of being articulate and being powerful in that. But if it, if it draws people away or draws them onto themselves or if people are, it mightn't be even them drawing people onto themselves. They might be just gifted. But if people are uh, being drawn onto you and you're very gifted and people are being drawn onto you, that even more so, you need to absolutely not fall into the pride of praise or the pride of just a crowd. Just because you've got a big crowd does not necessarily mean that you're actually, you are a big church for that matter, does not necessarily mean that you are actually preaching the gospel well. You know, Paul says there, God will judge in the end of the day. Those who seem to be, and he talks about being faithful and, and so forth and so on, God will be my judge. So, we are called to be mature. This whole book of Corinthians is helping the carnal church become truly spiritual or helping the immature church become mature. This aspect here is part of that. So again, how can I have a hermeneutic? If I want to help uh, young Christians become mature, I can use the Corinthian church as an example of how to grow in maturity. Of course, we go into all about faith, hope, and love, about a fellowship with the Holy Spirit, the grace, the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. These are linchpins in actually the Corinthians books, these two, these two phrases, these Trinitarian phrases, faith, hope, and love, and love of God faith in the grace of Jesus and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. These are linchpins in about bringing maturity into Christians' lives or into a church life. So I hope that helps. So in our Dig Deep, for instance, you would have one of the things I try and do is in helping others is this is I would have those question sheets. Now, some people, when you get those question sheets, they get very kind of like, particularly if they're a Christian for a while, they can get very, um, well, you give me these stupid questions, you know, Questions like, as I said, say for instance that, that phrase, that, that verse there. I'm just taking that verse for instance, verse 18. Uh, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Uh, you know, and, and, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And if you, the question is simply in the question sheet, um, where, where's the power of God? It's in the message of the cross. You know, where's, the question is, where's the power of God? Look up chapter 1 verse 18 of Corinthians. It's in the message of the cross. Okay, simple answer. It's not rocket science, but it, clar it cleanses the mind. It, it anchors you in the truths of the scripture. Now, sometimes when I give those kind of questions and answer sheets, some people get very offended. It offends their intelligence. It offends their pride. And you know what? Good. Because we need to be humble. We need to dig deep into the word of God. But if somebody digs deep into the word of God in a humble way, it will cleanse their soul. It will absolutely clarify in their minds and hearts good thinking. 
good thinking by which the Holy Spirit can use that good thinking then and make them actually more powerful. <coughs> so one of the things I do is that I, uh, when I'm trying to help somebody, I really want to d d them to really what, who, what, when, where, to bombard the text with all these questions. And we'll probably look at some of that a little bit more as we go along. They don't necessarily have to do like a question and answer sheet that I do. That's one of the methods I do because I want to help people to write it down because I know the, the thing about writing it down and stuff. And it's something I do all the time. It's something I will do when I'm going through a book of the Bible. I will literally go through a book of the Bible and ask every question of every sentence and every phrase. And it really helps to really, what is God saying? I, I don't want to just come up with my own thinking. And then as a Pentecostal, then I have a place to hear the prophetic word because I've listened to God's prophetic voice through the word, through the written word, I can actually hear the prophetic word without even saying, thus saith the Lord. I can just speak it out and people can receive it or reject it either way. So I want to encourage you to have that. Now we'll probably look a little bit more into that a little bit later uh, in the study. Now we, I want to... Re Go back into, uh, let me look at my notes here if there's something else I wanted to cover there for tonight as we go into it. Um, yeah. yeah. And from there also, as you dig deep, you see, then then it's from there that you can maybe take a word. For instance, you could wisdom or something like that. And you can actually begin then to do what's called word studies. Uh, for instance, you might study the word wisdom or you might study the word foolishness or you might study... Uh, some word there even the power of God or the message demands a sign you, you could you could look up different words there and start doing a word study but again the word study is within the uh, initially within the context of the of the sentence within the context of the passage within context of the section within context of the book uh, that helps a lot as well so I'm going to leave it there I hope you've been blessed tonight I hope it was a blessing to you as we done some stuff there um good stuff again this is only uh, trying to help you a little bit how i how i would want to help you in interpreting uh, let me go into facebook Let's see who's there hi kevin it's good to see you uh good stuff true unity only found in knowing christ crucified amen good stuff pascal hi kevin i just see you after popping in there uh let me go over to youtube uh, hi Alish, good stuff, amen. So I, I just want to encourage you then that this is really, I just want to say it again, I know I'm repeating myself, but it's really important to us, as pe those of you who are Pentecostal particularly. See, we, we walk with the Holy Spirit. One of the problems with the Pentecostal churches is they're not deep in the word. On the other side of it, you have some evangelical churches who are deep in the word, but they don't, they don't recognize the Holy Spirit as a person and we fellowship with him and he empowers us. So there's a, you know, there's a mix there. But we as Pentecostals, R.T. Kandel put it this way. I think or, some of you might know R.T. Kandel. He was a, um, a faithful preacher in London who was also in America. And he said, it's like as if there's been a divorce in the church. A divorce between those who are word-based and those who are spirit-filled based. And that the word-based, you know, it's like the wife went off this way and the spirit-filled base went off this way. And what happens sometimes in a divorce when a divorce happens is the children sometimes some children side with the father or go with the father and some children side with the mother and go with the mother and so like it's kind of like that has happened within the church it's like as if there's those spirit filled who side with the spirit filled side and there's the word based and the side but that's it's somewhat dysfunctional but if we genuinely truly become a functional family of god that all churches become better and all it starts with disciples it starts with leaders and disciples it starts with church council leaders life group leaders it starts where where it's at if we all become better at fellowshipping and walking in the friendship and in the power of the holy spirit but also knowing that the holy spirit brings us the word and as we get the word into us the mind of christ into us that we we have both we we work with both and in the love of the father as well is another aspect so walking in the word and the grace of Jesus, walking in the fellowship and friendship and the power of the Holy Spirit and walking in the love and the sovereignty of God the Father. When we get all the Trinitarian work within us, we become way more mature and powerful and effective for God in our lives and the lives of those around us. 
And so by God's grace, we will be that people. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing hermeneutics. That's one of the reasons why within Foursquare, we want to make sure hermeneutics is one of the solid things within. It's only one. It's only one of them, but a good solid block within our church or within those who are leaders, within the, all of that. So I hope you're being blessed tonight as we just looked at some of that. And also some of the logic of why we do dig deep whenever you do, do, do dig deep studies or if you're doing dig deep studies with someone else why we're breaking it down there's reasons why we're asking these questions it's not to we're not trying to be a pain in the neck we're not trying to ask silly questions no there's reasons why there's reason even if it seems boring at the time it's to give the holy spirit opportunity to exegete out what the truth is of the word to them then so that we can bring uh, extrapolate that for the word for us now today in a very solid healthy way and powerful and effective Amen and amen. God bless you. Now remind, I just want to say next week and the week after that, there will not be a study. For those who are, uh, Elizabeth for instance, those of you are in London and those of you are in Dublin and stuff like that, uh, unless I have your phone number, please, you can send me a message on Facebook, a private message on Facebook, if you want to send me your phone number. Uh, I will, if you send me your phone number and make sure to put your name to it and everything, if you send me your phone number, you'll be on the text message list for anything that's happening within hermeneutic studies. Send me your current phone number because I want to make, if I don't have it already, I want to make sure you're on the list and I will be sending out a text to remind you that there's no study next week and the week after. And then also because you might forget that then there will be a study, I want to send out a text message to you to say, yes, we're back online that Wednesday and otherwise you might forget. And I want to keep you going as we're coming more and more closer to the end that you've studied well hermeneutics. So be blessed and be a blessing and know that God's word is true. God wants you to honor his word, love his word, and then be absolutely blessed and in, in, in the truth of it and to have foundation of it in your life and that you will be a blessing to yourself and to others around you as your soul receives and is engrafted into the word of God. Be blessed and be a blessing. God bless you. Thank you very much, guys. God bless you. Bye-bye.